بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم Good, very good question. I think the brother has a question, then I will come to you, yes. Uh, <clears throat> down through the years of Christianity, for 2,000 years, they've evolved into different segments and sects and divisions. They've even changed the belief. Uh, what changes have happened in Islam? Do you have any fundamental belief that which has changed in the last few centuries? Okay, very good question. So, what is your name? Charlie. Okay, Brother Charlie is asking the question that in the history of Christianity, since the last 2,000 years, many changes happen even in the fundamental beliefs. And he's asking the question, have there been any changes in Islam, right, since the last many centuries, correct? In the fundamental beliefs, zero change. See, these are the fundamental beliefs in the absolute one God, not Trinity, not idol worship, not multiple gods. So every single Muslim in the history of Islam, nobody changed that. Right now, this is also what we believe. So the Quran mentions it, absolute oneness of God, and every Muslim, nobody diluted that. We are not attaching Muhammad, peace be upon him, along with God. Unlike our Christian friends, they attach Jesus along with God or the Father, right? So that fundamental belief remained the same. The second fundamental belief that remained is that Quran is uh, one. There is only one version of the Quran all over the world. Compared to our Christian brothers and sisters, you have different versions of the Bible. The Protestants have like 66 books in the Bible. Catholics have 73 books in the Bible. Greek Orthodox has 78 books in the Bible. But there is only one version of the Quran all over the world. The third belief that remained the same is the way that we Muslims pray. Every, you know, I have never been to China, Joanne. Suppose if I go to China, I would feel at home going to the mosque because they would pray exactly the same way, the way that this our mosque, Islamic Foundation North prays. So when you see Muslims pray up there, if you go to a mosque in China, you will think, you know what? I just saw the same way Muslims pray in Chicago. So that remained the same all over the world for all the Muslims. But our Christian brothers and sisters, when I go to a church, I have been to many churches, Catholic, Protestant, Jehovah's Witnesses, they all have different ways of praying. And then I can go on and on, right? So the important thing is, we say that the Quran is the last and the final testament, revelation by, from God to all of humanity, and God is protecting the Quran from any change. The theology of the Quran and also the practices how Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, how he practiced the Quran. We also have volumes preserved, his practices, his example, his sayings. So since we have the original literature, people memorize the Quran also. Do any one of you know that you know the whole Quran has been memorized? Is it written in the Quran that men and women cannot worship in the mosque at the same time? Okay, okay, I got it. So, so the sister is asking, does it... Is it written in the Quran that the men and women, they cannot worship next to each other, correct? So actually, yes. It says in chapter number 33, verse number 21, I will just give the translation. My voice is not as sweet as Saleh and Yusuf, all right? I'll just give the translation to you. Chapter 33, verse number 21 says that in the person of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, you have a good example to follow. For those who believe in Allah in the last day and remembers Allah much. So the Quran is saying to follow the practices of Muhammad peace be upon him. So in the mosque of Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, there was a segregation between men and women when they pray. The Imam, the person leading the prayer was a man, so that was the Prophet. And then the males used to stand shoulder to shoulder in lines and the women they used to stand behind. So we are following the traditions and the actions and the recitations of what Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So he was taught by Angel Gabriel and Angel Gabriel brought that message to the Prophet. But then you may be thinking, okay, why is there a segregation? There is a logical, uh, rational reason behind it. You know, as I mentioned upstairs, we pray like touching each other shoulder to shoulder. So I would not be comfortable, suppose, if I'm praying, my wife is next to me, and next to her is a strange man touching her, right, shoulder. 
She would not be comfortable, I would not be comfortable. And she would not be comfortable if a pretty lady stands next to me, right? Come on, it, it works both ways. So our concentration should only be focused towards God, not towards who is touching a person of opposite gender. Plus the way that we pray, as you have seen upstairs, we stand up, we bow down, and then we prostrate. It will not be decent if a lady is prostrating in front of me, right? Uh, and I'm standing here as a man. She would not feel comfortable. So for the sake of decency and chastity, right? And the focus, God in his infinite wisdom, he has segregation between males and females. And we are following the tradition of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. But this is not unique only to the, uh, to the mosque. If you go to a Jewish synagogue, there is segregation. Like an Orthodox Jewish synagogue especially, right? If you go to a, a Greek Orthodox church, there would be segregation. Exactly for that same reason of chastity, decency. So focus is always towards the Creator. I hope you understand. Right? Wonderful. Yes, sister. Uh, <clears throat> Moses was given the Ten Commandments and they became the basis for laws and behavior. Is there something in the Quran that is like that? And if you don't obey, is within the Muslim practice a way to correct or judge the person who has not followed the, the law? Okay, wonderful. The question is, you know, Prophet Moses, he was given the Ten Commandments. Actually, in the Old Testament, the Tanakh, there are 613 commandments, to be exact, all right? Well, yes. Yeah, there is. I read the Bible, okay? 613 to be exact, but the, but the most important ones of all of them would be the Ten Commandments, which are there in the book of Exodus, chapter 20, verse number 3, Deuteronomy 5 and 6. So the question is, are there certain commandments like that in the Quran? Definitely all of those commandments in different versions, they're also present in the Quran. Like the very first commandment of the Quran and also of the Old Testament is this, that there is only one God, you should not take anyone else besides me. That's the first commandment, Quran says something similar. As Yusuf just recited, right? Honor your parents, one of the commandments. The Quran says, in uh, chapter 17, verse number 22, 23, 24, respecting and honoring parents. To such a degree, you know, one of the posters up there, one of you are amazed to find out, it says the respect that Islam gives to parents, especially mothers. One of the posters, the white poster, it says, paradise lies beneath your mother's feet. But respecting, honoring, taking care, obeying our parents, especially mothers, that's one of the ways to go to paradise. One of the commandments speak about, the Old Testament commandments speak about being good to the neighbors. The Quran says something similar. Even Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he said that you're not a full believer if you eat your foe and your neighbor is hungry. So there are commandments, many more commandments than even the Old and the New Testament. And these commandments also go into detail about how to be righteous, how to be God-fearing, how to be God-focused, how to transform yourself in the society. So Quran, see, unlike the Bible, unlike the Old Testament that came for certain people certain time, we say that the Quranic commandments, they came for all people and for all time. Because, yes, go ahead. Then the second part of the question, what happens within your group, your congregation, if you know that a person has not followed that. Sure, sure. So the question is, what happens if the person does not follow certain commandment? So it depends which commandment. If the commandment is affecting the, pub the public norm and the public discord, then the person in an Islamic state, a true Islamic state, there would be check and balances just like we have here in this country. For example, the Old Testament, one of the Ten Commandments, it says, do not commit murder, right? Do not kill, but do not commit murder is the better translation. So of course, in one of the 57 Muslim majority countries, if someone does murder somebody, obviously the person has to be punished by whatever the law says of that land. 
But suppose if the person is uh, not praying five times a day, right? Or forgets to pray the morning prayer, it is between that person and God. The Imam of the mosque, they can educate the congregation. You know what, these are the rewards. Make sure that you pray. Make sure that you don't become lazy and be so much into the wall and avoid and, and, and not be conscious of the wonderful guidance. So Imam can instruct and educate, but the Imam cannot punish a person. For example, the Imam who was here, he cannot punish a person if the person is not praying. But in Muslim countries, if anyone is breaking the law, that would be one of the commandments of the Quran, then the person would be punished based upon what law that they break. For example, drinking, right? Islam prohibits drinking. There is zero percent tolerance for drinking in Islam. The Quran says in chapter 5, verse number 90 to be exact, that no gambling, no intoxicants, these are Satan's handiwork. Don't do it. Right? Forbidden. So in a Muslim country, for example, Indonesia, Malaysia, right, Turkey, if somebody is drinking, like openly and encouraging people, then there would be laws against that, based upon which country and what law. So yes, there are some spiritual commandments, then they are commandments that affect the whole community. If somebody breaks this, then the, then the constitution of that land comes into play. If someone breaks the spiritual commandments, then the Imams, they can instruct the person, you know, obey the commandments, you will get a great reward, right? Or else there would be sin. So, in that way, we can balance out the spiritual commandments and the community commandments. Yes, sister. Yes. I'm Italian. I like pasta. I have a glass of wine with my pasta. I can't be a Muslim. Oh, uh, well... <laughs> Would you love God more or would you love your pasta and wine more? <laughs> All right, make a choice. Both. Well, if the God says, avoid the pasta and the wine, wine and I will give you something better up there, right? What would you do now? God gave you the wine. He made, he made the drinks. He made the wine. Well, he also gave us the technology to, to make a knife, right? Use it the right way or use it some other way, correct? So just because God gave us something, we have to use it the best way so we don't harm our bodies. See, our bodies are a responsibility, a property that God has given to us. So we'll be held accountable on the day of judgment. How did we use our bodies, right? So we have to take care of them, exercising, eating the right things and eating healthy things. All of these are part of the comprehensive guidance that God has given. If we abide by it, then there will be Im immense uh, reward on the Day of Judgment in Paradise. I forget which one of the epistles of Paul, but it's written, a little wine is good for the stomach's sake. <laughs> well, uh, okay, if you have a question in the back, it was, okay. It was basically the same. He didn't know about the heart. So, <laughs> there so, you go, see? So, medical science says okay. even a little wine is not right. The current medical science. Okay, sorry, go ahead. So please. are you saying Muslims are not allowed to have any alcohol at all? Not even a glass of wine with dinner? Right. Yes, that's right. So Muslims cannot have not even a single drop of alcohol. I myself, you know, in my one of the classes when I was uh, taking health class in school, in high school, the teacher asked the question to all the students, okay, how many of you have never drank a single drop of alcohol? I was so proud to raise my hand, right? There were only two people who raised their hand, me and one more Muslim student. So what we say is that anything that God forbids, there is something harmful in that for us. And we know that alcohol, intoxicants and drugs, they are harmful, doesn't matter small quantity or bigger quantity. That's according to the AMA, the current research. See, if we go with the logic that let's only take some wine, some alcohol, a few drops, a few drinks up there, very soon a person may start taking more, right? A person who is a drunkard, for example, they start off with one drop of alcohol. That's only for alcohol. Yeah. Yeah, and but it's even not social drinking. Right. That's different. And in the New Testament, Jesus turned water into wine. Right. Wine. Well, it so be a good see, from a from a theological point of view, we say Quran forbids it. Correct. 
I cannot comment on the Bible because we don't uh, believe in the Bible, right? So I'm just speaking out about what the Quran says. Even from the biological, medical, physiological point of view, alcohol and wine and drugs, any intoxicants, they are harmful for the body. The cancers that they cause. 50% of the people who commit rapes and assaults, they have drunk or they have taken drugs. You know, 10 million cases of spousal abuse in this country. Unfortunately, right? Spousal abuse. Many of them, there is alcohol, intoxicants involved in there. Uh, gun shooting, gun violence out there. Alcohol, drugs, they're involved in there. So God knows what is good for us. God knows what is bad for us. So when he bans something, it may taste good, like as you say, right? It may taste good with the pasta. But what we say is, if, God, if we abide by God's commandments over here, if we abide by the commandments, we will get better rewards up there. Maybe better wine up there, right? Maybe better uh, fruits and better vegetables and better gardens and better houses. The best thing. So we need to abide. You know, just like when we went to schools and colleges, if the teacher says, do not chew gum in the classroom, we cannot have the excuse that, you know what, it tastes good for us, right? It's not going to fly. If the teacher says something, we just abide by it. Our teacher is saying this is wrong, this is bad for us, we just abide by it and hope for the great reward. Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. I was reading about how, the, how uh, Islam has uh, allowed women to be educated from the very beginning before anyone else. But now I read that in Afghanistan, women and girls are not allowed to be educated. How did this happen? Did somebody not get the memo? Okay, <laughs> that's a good question, right? My sister is asking the question that if Islam empowers and gives the rights and the obligations for women and girls and all the Muslims to read and to gain education, why didn't the people in Afghanistan guard the memo, right? So it's really important. We have to look at uh, different cultures and they may have different practices. They may not be 100% following what the Quran says, what Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him says, right? Second thing we need to know that not every news coming from those countries would be a credible news. Number three would be, based on my you know, small research, they, they don't want to ban education because no Muslim who knows the Quran and Islam can ban education. What they want to do is, they want to make sure that there is no free mixing between males and females in the classroom. So they want to create separate uh, schools for the girls and separate schools for the boys. Like, you know, I went to India, I went to an all boys Catholic school. And the name of the school, right, it was St. Paul School, right? So I went to their school and I was fine. I, appre I, I mean, I appreciated that. So I think they may be in the process of doing it. I'm not defending them, I'm just saying, if they are doing something that goes against Islam and the Quran, we need to condemn it, but we cannot condemn Quran because Quran gives us the obligation and the rights to gain education. But I can give one simple analogy, right? One simple analogy is this. According to the US government, according to the constitution, both men and women, they should get equal pay for equal work. All of us, we agree with that. But is that the reality on the ground? Who do we blame the constitution or those companies and those work environment, right? right? So exactly in the same way we say Islam is perfect, comprehensive, beneficial, practical, guidance for humanity. But if some culture, some people, the lack of understanding, political situation, turmoil, if they are not reflecting what Islam says, it is their shortcomings and does not take away from the perfection of Islam. So, so one important point that I hope that all of you today that you can take home is that we need to separate the culture and the cultural practices from the comprehensive, complete and perfect faith of Islam. You know, just like, then I will take your question, just like we cannot hold Christianity or Judaism responsible for the bad apples of the followers of Judaism and Christianity. You know, they are good and bad in the followers of any faith. Correct? Come on, that's a reality. So I cannot hold Christianity or Jesus or the Bible responsible for the crusaders, 
the Spanish Inquisition and the genocide of the Native Americans and the slave traders, right? And the list goes on and on, on and on. These were the people who abused Christianity and the Bible and they committed atrocities. In the same way, we cannot hold Islam responsible, the Quran responsible for the not so good practicing Muslims. So I hope and pray that we can differentiate uh, between Islam which is perfect and fallible Muslims and their cultural practices which are imperfect. I think, uh, th thank you so much. It's the last question for me, <laughs> and we, we go cut short. Of course, of course. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, last time I remember you said, uh, you know, you don't shake a hand with a woman because you respect your wife. But how come Quran allow the man have several wives? I think that's worse than you shake the hand, right? <laughs> okay. All right, so the question is this, uh, Sister Joanne. You are saying, saving the best question for the last, right? <laughs> so she's saying that I said last time when I went, when I came to your place, that Muslim men, we don't shake hands with the women of, or the opposite gender. And Muslim ladies, they don't shake hands with the men who are not part of our immediate family. And, uh, and you're right, because there is an etiquette, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, did not used to touch or shook hands or hug or kiss anyone who's not part of the immediate family, right? This is for the sake of decency, this is for the sake of respect, right? And this is the sake we want to honor our sisters, our mothers, our daughters, our uh, females, and we take them all as, you know, love, respect in our heart without touching them. So your question is, then how come then Islam allows to marry more than one, all right? Okay, so before, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, before he came to Arab, before he was born, polygamy or polygyny, having more than one wife, it was a norm, unrestricted polygamy. There was no restriction at all. A man can have like thousand wives if he wants to, right? That's not possible, but he can have that many. No restrictions. But the Quran came and it gave the restrictions. Number one. So it says in the Quran, chapter number 4, verse number uh, 3, that marry 2, 3, or up to 4. Right? So it, it gave, so Joanne, so it gave a restriction. You can marry up to 4, so it gave a restriction, right? But then it gave one more condition. The next passage says, if you cannot do justice, marry only one. All right? Just one, right? Yeah, why not? You can clap for that. But however, however, look at this. In our country, United States of America, there was a survey that came in Chicago Tribune. In the survey it says, a typical male, American male in this country, they have, in their lifetime, they have seven girlfriends. <laughs> Premarital or extramarital, right? No restriction. You can have as many girlfriends, as many extramarital affairs, right? No restriction, no responsibility, right? The poor woman can have babies and then he can run away. Where is the protection for that girl, for that lady? Islam came to protect the womenhood, our sisters, our mothers, our daughters. So multiple marriages with the proper protection and checks and balances and the restrictions and justice, it's actually a blessing for humanity, for the sisters. But let's, uh, let's not stop up there, right? If you look into the Old Testament and the New Testament and every other scripture around the world, all of them, they, okay, they permit multiple yeah. wives. Yeah, there is not a single passage, Joanne, in the Old Testament that prohibits men from marrying more than one. And then no restrictions at all. You know, for example, Moses had more than one wife. Abraham had more than one wife. David had more than one wife. Solomon had 700 wives. Can you imagine, guys? 700 wives, right? He was exhausted. <laughs> Exhausting, yeah, you can say that. 700 wives, not a single passage in the Old Testament that says, uh, you know what, have only one. Solomon, why did you marry more than one? Abraham, why more than one? So, Bible does not prohibit polygamy. Islam restricts polygamy. 
2, 3, up to 4, right? The New Testament, okay, let's go to the New Testament. There's not a single passage, Joanne, in the New Testament. In fact, Jesus allowed it. You know why? If you look at Matthew chapter 5, verse number 17, 18, and 19, Jesus will be considered as a mighty prophet. He said that I came not to destroy or to take away the law or the prophets. I came not to do away with it. I came to fulfill it. And anyone who takes away even a small portion of the law of the Old Testament, they would be the least in the kingdom. But anyone who upholds it, they would be the highest in the kingdom. And one of the laws of the Old Testament is permission to have more than one spouse. Right? So for any and all of these reasons, we say that yes, restricted polygamy is good for the women, good for society, compared to the current law that we have, one male and one female in marriage, but on the side you can have 50 girlfriends, 50 mistresses, and abuse, and suspicion, and divorce, and immorality, uh, babies without fathers, single parent homes, right? Single parent home, can you imagine, Joanne? According to Psychology Journal, children born of the single, uh, in the single parent homes, usually they have lower IQs. Usually they drop out of school. Usually they, their happiness index is low. They have more rate of depression. They have more rate of uh, suicides. All of these combined together, we say, God's guidance that he gave to us, it is good for humanity. Good for the women, good for the families, and it keeps humanity in checks and balance, unlike any system which is out there. I think the question is that uh, one man marry one woman, that's uh, better than one man limited for four women. Because like you said, yes, there's a bad crop, bad apple too. So law is supposed to be the law. One woman and one man, that's a marriage. That's what I understand. But anyway, thank you so much. So, you so, are so, wonderful. Yeah, so, so let me just yes. like a 30 second on that, right? <laughs> like in this country, Joanne, so, so Joanne is saying that, okay, fine, why not one male and one female, right? In marriage. See, in this country, there are more than 7 million extra females. So suppose if only one male marry only one female, what is going to happen, Joanne, to all of this excess of 7 million females, right? They would be without the comfort of a... <laughs> they would be without the comfort of a home, a husband and children, right? Family is the basic foundation of a civilization. All right, again, amazing. I really applaud all of you for coming. May God guide and bless all of us. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.